I wish I had been closer to everything that happened. I wish I knew more. If I had been closer, though, I might not have the privilege of sharing this story. They might have realized I was there and saw it happen. They might not have let me quit my job and stay alive. Up until a year ago, I worked for a very prominent corporation. My role was a small one, just delivering orders in a timely two-day fashion. I covered the northern half of a sprawling American city. I can't give out too many details, I'm sorry. Proper nouns are how people get caught. Most of my deliveries went out to businesses. Very rarely did I travel into the suburbs to make residential drops. My days were fairly routine. I arrived at the distribution center at 4 in the morning, loaded my blue van, and headed into the city. Deliveries took all day to complete, and every day was basically the same. And then one day my routine changed, and that was the moment I knew that something was wrong. After loading my truck, I was stopped by one of my superiors. He handed me an additional box and asked if I would take it with me. There was no label. No address describing where the box was going to or coming from. It wasn't paid for by any type of postage or stamp. It was an unremarkable box, half the size of a basketball. The cardboard packaging was colored black. I'd never seen a box quite like it. When I asked where the package was going, my superior waved me off. They assured me that it wasn't a delivery. I simply needed to carry the box with me along my route. They promised that other drivers had done so in the past. It was simply my turn, they explained. The box hadn't seen the northern half of the city just yet. The way they described it all was concerning. They said the box hadn't seen the city. I figured they just misspoke but never clarified thinking it was just a simple mistake. In my mind, they were testing some new GPS product that would likely be installed in our vehicles in the future, and they were keeping it in the box to keep anyone from tampering with it. The bonus they mentioned, if I completed this trip without damaging the package, was more than enough to seal the deal. So I drove around with my little black box. I kept it with me in the passenger seat. I wanted to have my eyes on it. When I stopped for lunch, I started to doubt my GPS theory, though. After spending time with it, I could tell that the package was humming. As I sat in my seat and worked my way through a slice of pizza, I kept glancing over at the box and almost jumped out of the van when it vibrated. I nearly dropped my slice. For a few seconds, I was convinced that I'd been tricked into smuggling a bomb aboard my van. When it didn't explode, I figured I was overreacting because it stopped humming once I finished my meal. In my mind, I joked with myself that the box was just hungry, envious of my lunch break. That or else it was impatient and wanted to get back to the road. For some reason, that idea stuck with me. Was the package keeping its own schedule? I returned back to the distribution facility and a different superior retrieved the box from my vehicle. They thanked me for a job well done and carried the package out of sight. I asked what it was. I even pitched my GPS theory. The question earned me a glare and a long period of silence. I apologized and left for the day. That reaction now had me determined, though. I was going to find out what was inside that box. I spoke to the other drivers and learned pretty quickly which of them had already given the box a tour of their delivery route. That narrowed down who would be escorting the package next. I kept my eye on those drivers who would be next. I then watched as one of them received the box and drove it around without incident. The next driver, however, was not so lucky. I arrived at the facility early that afternoon. I had rushed through my deliveries and skipped lunch so that I could arrive before this next driver. I wanted to see him hand off the box. Instead, when he pulled in, I watched as he jumped out of the driver's seat screaming. I kept my distance. I ducked into my own van and hunched down a bit behind the windshield. I wanted to watch as best as I could, but I didn't want to get caught. I watched as the frantic driver was tackled by security. I didn't even know we had security that could deal with that kind of thing. They pinned him to the ground and bound his hands. And might I say that they looked very professional while doing it. That driver was then carried away, hogtied. I guess they knocked him unconscious somehow. Next, I watched as my superiors rushed into his truck and brought out the box. 
I could see from my seat that the black cardboard had been torn open. They were obviously scared. They were all on their cell phones and moving so hurriedly that I wasn't surprised when two of them collided. This caused the box to fall and I could see something tumble out. It was shaped like a small pyramid. Most of it was silver, the color of steel. The way the light hit it, I'm confident it was metal. What I didn't understand were the veins. Thin green streaks ran across the surface of the pyramid. It looked like a leaf or thinly stretched skin. Those streaks were pulsating, throbbing. Watching it made my head hurt. Whatever it was, was scooped back into its box and the team of supervisors all scurried off to their offices. Someone was going to be upset with them, I could tell. But I could also tell that the pyramid thing wasn't ours. It didn't look like any piece of technology that I'd ever seen, and plenty had passed through my hands. When the other driver, the one who broke the box, didn't come back to work, I knew something was wrong. I knew my company was hiding something. I quit and I let things get quiet. This channel has given me a unique opportunity, though. I've taken all of the measures I need to stay safe. I think that you and your followers deserve to know. You can spread the word and warn others without endangering me. The big corporations out there are working for someone else. Maybe the government. Maybe something bigger than the government. I think that they're driving around and scanning our cities. They're preparing for something. I don't know what it is. I just know that if I stay silent, None of us will be ready for it. I don't know if you get a lot of college stories, but I've got one. My college was in West Hartford, Central Connecticut. It wasn't a big school, but it was big enough to need three residential halls. The smallest one was Mercy Dorm, which was just one floor converted for residential use in the original administration building. Mercy Building had more than just dorms. The basement level had a preschool where students could work for their practical credits. It also had the laundry room for the dorm at the very end of the wing. A lot of people wanted to get into Mercy because the rooms were bigger than normal and you'd be closer to the classroom buildings. Everybody wanted to skip the hike across the quad. But nobody but Mercy residents knew about the laundry room. The laundry room was freaky. That whole basement was creepy. Going down there at night made you feel like you were being watched. It didn't help that the school usually only had emergency lights turned on in the hallways when the preschool wasn't in session, so it was dark. During the day, it wasn't so bad. The hall lights were on and there was a little light coming through the basement windows. It almost looked normal. At night, the basement just plain felt scary. Everybody thought so. It wasn't the fake Halloween kind of creepy either. It felt more serious than that. All of us residents tried to do our laundry during the day. Unfortunately, there weren't a lot of machines, and even though we weren't a big dorm, sometimes it was hard to find a free one. That meant that you had a really good chance of having to go down to the basement at night. If you were lucky, you were just picking up your stuff. If you weren't, you'd be doing your whole laundry cycle at night. Nobody ever stayed there and waited. We just threw our things in and left. Maybe it was the exposed pipes on the ceiling that made it feel so freaky. I don't know, everybody seemed to have a different reaction. Some people just felt nervous but didn't know why. Some people felt a cold chill. I guess I was different because that wasn't how I felt. I always felt like I was being watched. It wasn't too bad when there were two or three of us trying to do our laundry but it was really bad when I was alone. At first, I tried to shake it off because there was nobody in the room with me. Then I tried to tell myself it was my imagination. I'd start singing or talking to myself. Anything to make noise? As long as I was making noise, I could fool myself. Everything was normal, but it stopped being normal every single time I went to the elevator. You know how elevators take forever to get to your floor? This elevator was exactly the same way. It was one of those old-fashioned ones where you had to wait for the gate to open. It took an extra long time to get yourself safely into the elevator, because every time I had to go between the laundry room and the elevator, I heard footsteps. They always started down by the preschool, 
at the opposite end of the hallway. Then they started toward the laundry room on the opposite end of the hall, getting faster and faster until they got to where the elevator was on the left side of the laundry room. The first time I heard it, I thought the janitor was down there with me, but I never saw him. I thought maybe I missed him, but then it happened again and again, every time. I know I know footsteps. Big deal. But it was more than that. This sense of a threat and anger were present, and the more I went down to that floor, the worse it got until I swear I saw a face pressed against the little window in the elevator door as it went up. I was freaked out. I started asking around the dorm to see if anyone else heard anything weird or saw anything they couldn't explain. While everybody said they didn't like the laundry room and even some of the student teachers said they didn't like staying after hours in the preschool, nobody had an experience like mine. My friends and I started checking the library to see if we could find any old news stories that would help us figure out what was haunting that level. I never really expected to find anything, but I was wrong. In an old West Hartford newspaper from 1963, we found a report on an accident at the college. The old boiler had exploded, killing the janitor, Bob Gardner. Just so you know, the boiler was right across from the elevator in the basement of Mercy Dorm. Right across from the laundry room. Guess I hadn't really been wrong about the janitor being down in the basement at the same time I was. You'd think that having some proof that I wasn't crazy would make everything better, but it really didn't. The next time I had to wash to do and I felt that creepy watching you feeling, I started talking out loud. If I had a bucket list at that time in my life, talking to a ghost would not have been on it. And it turns out, just because you think you know one's name does not actually help much. In fact, it got worse. The feeling of being watched started to follow me up the elevator, three floors up. It even started to feel bad in the daytime. But even that was nothing compared to that last night. I was trying to study for my English Lit final. My roommate had already finished and was out partying. All I remember is staring at my notes on Chaucer one minute and the next I felt this horrible pressure all around me. I felt like this cold force was surrounding me on three sides and then I heard this voice whisper scream leave in my head. I have never been so terrified in my life as I was then. I don't know what I would have done or what I could have done if my roommate hadn't come back just then. As soon as the door opened, the feeling and the coldness went away. Was I tired and hallucinating? Or did I get a visit from a very unfriendly ghost? All I know is that I grabbed my stuff and hiked across campus to spend the night in my friend's room. As soon as senior finals were over, I packed up and went home. I never told anybody outside my friends this story, and I haven't thought of it in years. But now I wonder, is Bob still haunting Mercy Dorm's laundry room? When I was little, my grandparents lived right next door to us. But next door in rural Kentucky meant half a mile down a dirt road. When I was old enough, maybe seven or eight, my parents started allowing me to walk to their house on my own. As long as I told them where I was going and made it home before dark. Our road rarely ever had traffic on it and was safe enough for a kid to travel, but I liked to cut through the forest instead. The undergrowth was thick in most places, but I found a deer trail to follow most of the way. It was a lot quicker than taking the road and most of the time felt safer. However, my grandma always warned me that there were things that lived in the forest I wouldn't find in encyclopedias. These things weren't to be trifled with, she said. I used to think she was just telling me stories so I wouldn't go out at night and get lost. But when she learned I was going through the forest to get to her house instead of walking along the road, she told me one warning that would stick with me forever. If you feel something that's not quite right, you get out of the forest. You stick to the road or you call me and I'll pick you up if you want to come visit, she said. There's always something about them that's not quite right. Something you can't put your finger on. Something, somewhere, feels wrong. I asked her what she was talking about, but she never explained it further. I'll be honest, what my grandma said creeped me out. 
I never went in the forest after dark and I never saw anything weird there. I continued to use the forest trail to visit my grandma. If I ever stayed after dark, she made sure to drive me home. I didn't give her words much thought until one day after school, I was walking along the deer trail like usual, and I heard my grandma calling my name. It sounded like it was coming from somewhere inside the forest, but I couldn't figure out the location. I called back to her and asked where she was. She sounded distressed and just kept repeating my name over and over. She sounded close enough that I should have been able to see her. I asked again where she was, but she just called back my name. In my head, I knew something wasn't right. She should have answered me and told me where she was. And then I remembered what she told me a few months prior. Something, somewhere, feels wrong. And I ran out of the woods as fast as my legs could carry me. I ran straight to my grandma's front door and burst inside. My grandma was sitting in the living room in her favorite chair. I don't know if I was surprised to see her there or not. What were you calling me for? I asked. I didn't call you. I'm glad you've come to visit, though, she said. But I heard you. In the forest. You were calling my name. She rose from her chair and knelt in front of me. When did you hear me calling you? She asked. I told her it was just a moment ago. Her face changed in that moment. She grabbed my shoulders and said, That wasn't me you heard, and you stay well away from that forest. You never go in there again. If you want to come to my house, you call me and I'll come get you. And I listened to my grandma. I stayed far away from the wood. Years passed without incident, and my grandma kept her promise. If I wanted to visit, I called her up and she came to get me. I was at her house one day. I was 14 or 15 years old at the time. I was harvesting and pressing native plants for a school biology project. There were a several species of wildflowers that grew on my grandma's land that I wanted to get samples from. Still, I made sure not to cross the threshold into the forest. I was close to the edge of the woods, but still in plain sight of the house. My grandma was rolling out a pie crust in the kitchen last I saw. She most likely was watching me out the kitchen window. I didn't feel unsafe out there. That is, until I heard my name being called from inside the forest. I ran back to the house and my grandma knew by the look on my face what I was about to say. It called my name again. I asked my grandma what it was. I could tell she didn't want to talk about it, but at this point I needed to know. She didn't divulge much, but she did tell me it was some sort of creature. She said it looks like a ghoul and they live all over the place. Usually rural, wilderness places. Sometimes forests, sometimes caves. They can mimic sounds they've heard. Animal sounds and sometimes voices, but they can't talk. They can only repeat things like a parrot. I asked if it was dangerous and my grandma only said that nothing kind would try to lure you into the forest using the voice of someone you trust. And that was the last we ever spoke of it. I continued to visit my grandma, but I never ventured too far from the house. I never heard about the creature again and I'm thankful I never saw it. Though sometimes I wonder what it looked like. I was so relieved when my grandma moved into an apartment in town. I sometimes still have questions when I think back to the creature in the forest. I wish I had asked her if she ever saw it herself or if it had a name. How many of them are around and why don't people talk about them? But she's much older now and I don't want to bring those memories back to the surface. When you think of Michigan, you probably think of the Great Lakes, or at least I do. And naturally, when you think of the Great Lakes, you've probably heard about how dangerous they can be and the possible creatures that lurk beneath the surface. But what if I told you Michigan is home to something far more wicked, something that lurks on the land, in the forests? Yeah. Honestly, I wouldn't have believed it either. That was until I saw it with my own eyes. My house was sort of the party house in high school. Nothing too crazy, really, but definitely the home that all my friends would flock to during school breaks, where we could have bonfires, drink, and smoke in peace. Usually, bonfires were reserved for the spring or fall, given how hot the nights were in the summer. 
But I remember this particular summer night, a cold front had come in off the lakes, and the air was just cool enough that we felt inclined to gather up wood and start a fire. Our property was surrounded by woods, so me and my four friends had all spread out in different areas, doing our best to find branches that weren't wet and would easily spark. I was hacking into a dead tree when I suddenly heard a blood-curdling scream. My body ran cold, and without hesitation I sprinted out of the woods into the backyard to see what was going on. As all of my other friends followed quickly behind, Kevin emerged looking particularly distraught and out of breath. He rushed us into the house, and between gasps of air swore to us he had seen something in the woods. He exclaimed that he couldn't make out what it was in the distance, but it was massive in size, black, and maneuvering on its legs almost like some sort of gorilla. Now, I don't know about there being gorillas in Michigan, but I do know there are black bears. And even though Kevin swore that's not what this was, I countered that perhaps it was reaching up against a tree, so it looked taller and as though it were standing on two legs. After some heavy convincing, Kevin seemed to relinquish to the idea that he truly did just see a bear, and we all brought out attention back to the bonfire. A few hours had passed at this point, and the sun was already setting. We pulled the pit away from the woods and closer to the house to further alleviate any weariness, and in no time the sky fell dark and the stars came out. We sat around the bonfire for quite some time, reminiscing on the middle school days when the five of us had become friends. Eventually we pulled out hot dogs, sausages, and s'mores ingredients, and once all of us were fat and happy, the alcohol made its appearance. We started with shots and eventually switched over to mixed drinks, but truth be told, we all had far more than what we really should have. But we were high school boys. What did we know about moderation? Eventually, Jimmy recommended we play a game of what are the chances, and so commenced the night full of fun. It started with harmless pranks like calling an ex-girlfriend, taking a body shot, jumping into the pool naked. But eventually, it came time for Kevin's turn. As the story would go, Jimmy dared Kevin to go back into the woods by himself and face whatever creature it was he saw that day. It was clear to me Kevin was uncomfortable, and it made me upset knowing the other boys would rag on him if this dare went unanswered. So in an attempt to be the heroic friend, which really just meant the alcohol was glorifying my bravery, I volunteered to take Kevin's place. And without a second thought, I marched into the woods destined to prove to the guys that I was the manliest of them all. I trekked deep into the forest, and at some point along the way, I had the brilliant idea that I would hide behind a tree until the guys came looking for me, at which point I would give them a real scare. But in my drunken haze, minutes turned into what felt like hours before I heard any sign of life. The rustling, which I thought was coming from my friends, prompted me to peek out from behind my hiding place. And just as I did, my body froze, nowhere near prepared for what I saw next. Nearly eight feet tall, teeth snarled and sharp as razors and piercing eyes. But the thing that really made my skin curl was that this creature seemed to have the body of a man and the face of a dog. The head was covered in a mane of black fur with a protruding snout, while the rest of his figure seemed almost human-like, wide shoulders, chiseled muscles, and human legs. I went to scream, but it was as though my voice was stuck in my throat. Honest to God, I think that's what saved me that night because this thing was not looking in my direction, and had I made any noise, it certainly would have been. My saving grace was that I was probably thirty feet away from this creature, and the crunching of leaves as it brooded through the woods, well as its guttural growling, shadowed my labored breathing. As the creature made its way in the opposite direction of my hiding spot, I prayed in a way I had never done before. When the sound of its footsteps trailed off into the distance, I waited maybe a minute more before sprinting as fast as I could back to the safety of my backyard. When I came barreling out of the woods, I finally started yelling to my friends, whose faces instantly went from laughing to concerned. I rushed everyone inside, recounted the creature as best I could, and in an instant, we were all sobered up. The police were contacted and by morning an investigation went underway for a man with a dog mask lurking in the woods.
A couple of years ago, I got the chance to do a few days of house sitting for a friend in northwestern Washington outside Lake Stevens. I'd always dreamed about living out in the country, even though I'd never spent much time out there, so I jumped at the chance. Amy's place wasn't big, but it sat on a nice wooded property. It was a really rural dirt road and everything. I think it had been her grandparents' place and she'd inherited it. Anyway, she gave me the run of the place and said I could do what I wanted, but I should be inside by dark. I remember thinking that was a weird thing to say. I mean, I was in my 20s. I wasn't a kid with a curfew. But hey, Amy was paying me to have a weekend in the country, so I decided not to argue. Anyway, I found the little dirt driveway just fine and got there with plenty of time for my friend to head to the airport. I spent the day getting to know her two old dogs, got myself settled, and was tired enough from the drive to go to bed early. As far as house sitting gigs go, this was easy. It felt like a little vacation, like I was getting paid to hang out in a little house in the woods and live out my homesteading fantasies without actually having to commit to buying a house. It was great. The only thing that was weird about it was how dark it got at night. I've lived in Seattle all my life, so I wasn't prepared for just how dark it got when the sun finally went down out here. It was dark and quiet. The house was far enough off the main road that I couldn't even hear the occasional passing car. About the only thing I did hear at night was rustling from the woods. There had to be animals out there, deer or maybe even a bobcat. I wasn't worried, though. The dogs and I were good. The night before Amy was coming home, I decided to go check the garden for salad fixings. It was a nice big plot with a fence around it to discourage rabbits or deer. I don't garden, but Amy had told me that all I had to do was water it and it'd take care of itself. When I got into the garden, I noticed that it looked like something had been eating some of the plants. Deer, probably, or rabbits. I looked around the fence line and didn't see any holes, but there was a section that was folded down, like something had stepped on it. There was an old shed on the property that was where Amy kept her gardening stuff. The door was hard to open. That thing was old. But I did find some stakes I could use to prop up the sagging fence, so I grabbed them. The shed was literally set into the tree line, so I had to get right up to the woods to get into it. It was closer to the trees than I'd been the whole time I'd been there, and I remember the temperature really dropped that close to the trees. It felt weird, too, like something was watching me. I told myself that I was just being silly, but I also didn't stick around. I just grabbed what I needed and headed back to the garden plot. I did a decent patch job on the fence by tying the fence mesh to the stake. When I was done, I noticed that a few tomatoes had fallen off the vine. They weren't even bruised, but they were still green. I decided to stick them on the windowsill so they could finish ripening. I picked some ripe tomatoes, a couple radishes, and some lettuce leaves, and took them into the house to make my salad and grill a burger. The dogs and I had a nice quiet dinner. They woke up enough to stagger over to their food bowls and then watch me eat my burger and salad. Turns out I'm not immune to big sad puppy eyes, and I ended up giving them part of my burger. In the middle of the night, I heard rustling again. I woke up enough to listen, and it sounded far enough away that I decided not to worry about it. But then I heard a snapping sound a lot closer. The dogs perked up too. Now here's where it gets weird, because those dogs, they were old and sweet, and they'd spent most of the day sleeping in the nearest warm sunbeam like pit bull-shaped pillows. Right now they were perked up, looking out the door toward the kitchen. They didn't move. They just looked. I heard rustling around again like something was walking around. I figured it was that deer that had broken down the fence and that the garden was once again in mortal danger. I slid out of bed, grabbed my maglite from the bedside table, and tiptoed my way down the hall. The kitchen looked out over the garden, so my plan was to shine the flashlight out the window and hopefully scare the deer away. The tree line was a good distance away, but I couldn't see much in the way of detail that far out in the yard, just spiky shapes. What I did see was something moving around in the garden. I flicked on the mag light and aimed it out at the yard. At first I didn't see anything, but I swept the light across the yard, and then I saw something I never want to see again. 
It looked like a hairy reddish-brown lump, but it definitely wasn't a deer. It was too big. I thought maybe it was a bear because it stood up on its hind legs. Then it turned around and I got a look, and it was no bear. The thing had this weirdly shaped head like a gorilla, and no hair on its face like a gorilla. But there was no way there could be a gorilla loose in the woods of northern Washington. It was huge, too, taller than the six-foot stake I'd put into the ground to fix the fence earlier and built like a linebacker. Whatever it was, it did not like the light because it wrinkled its face into a snarl and let out this growl that sounded like four angry Rottweilers all at once. I panicked. I dropped the flashlight and tried to back up, but I was shaking so hard that I went to my knees. I heard stomping across the 